All right, so a very warm welcome to all of you um, to this event uh, this afternoon on China. So in this series on uh, democracy at the uh, CEU Democracy Institute, our topic today is uh, does China's COVID management legitimize its non-democracy? So this is a uh, um, provocative title. It is meant to be provocative so that uh, uh, it should incite several different uh, perspectives and reactions. Um, my name is Agota Davis. I'm sitting in Berlin. I'm a Sinologist, Hungarian Sinologist working at uh, the China Center of uh, Technical University Berlin. And uh, let me introduce you our panelists first. Um, Joanna Klobisch. Um, hello, Joanna. Uh, has studied East Asian studies with a focus on China, also intercultural communication, first in Heidelberg, uh, but then also in China, in Tianjin, and also in Taiwan, in Taipei. So um, uh, she has uh, um, a very uh, substantial China background. Um, he was in charge uh, for four years uh, of the EU-China NGO twinning program, and she is now program manager of the China program at Stiftung Asian House in Germany. Uh, but right now she is sitting in Poland. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Shu Ming, a freelance journalist. Uh, he was born and raised in Beijing, and uh, as far as I understand, he also studied journalism in China. Uh, before moving to Germany in the 1980s, late 1980s. Um, he has been living in Germany ever since. Um, uh, he, he speaks actually absolutely wonderful German and also English. And uh, he is a regular commentator in several uh, English language uh, uh, media outlets like Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, RD, ZDF, Süddeutsche Zeitung, and so on. Um, Richard Turchani uh, is a senior researcher at Polotsky University Olomouc. He's also sitting at, in Olomouc now. Um, uh, he is a political scientist. Uh, uh, he studied international relations, economics, and political science in Brunel and received his PhD there at the Department of International Relations and European Studies. Uh, now, now he's uh, program director at the Central European Institute of Asian Studies uh, uh, at the university, and uh, he has just recently finished a survey on the European perceptions of China, uh, which might also be relevant for us today. So uh, they are our three panelists for today, and uh, the discussant for today is uh, Shandor Kushai. Um, a former colleague of mine um, who practically left his whole uh, professional career almost until now as a professional diplomat uh, working on China, with China, in China. He was also ambassador for Hungary in China between uh, 19, uh, 2008 and 2014. Uh, now he is an honorary associate professor at Pazmai Peter Catholic University in Budapest. Um, we would have had a second discussant, Katalin Che, but unfortunately she cannot make it today. So uh, um, uh, we have uh, four uh, speakers in different roles for today, and I will be moderating the discussion. The rundown uh, is as follows. Uh, first, I want to ask the three panelists uh, to uh, give us their opening statements, uh, three minutes the maximum on the lead question, so on China's COVID management and its connection to legitimacy. Then we will have approximately half an hour for an open discussion uh, centering around uh, three main topics. Um, after that, I will ask uh, uh, Mr. Kushai um, to add uh, a few remarks and further aspects uh, to what we have heard. And starting from three o'clock sharp, I want to open the table, open the floor for Q&A because I expect a lot of uh, questions. Uh, this is really a very intriguing topic. So uh, I want to give chance uh, uh, 
for the audience to ask uh, as many questions and uh, as openly as possible. So uh, let's give it a go. And may I ask you, Joanna, to start? Ladies first. <laughs> Thank you, Agota. All right, three minutes was not enough, but I will try to um, get into this very, very interesting title you choose for your event. So, um, well, we in Stiftung Asienhaus China program always look at more than the political sphere in China. We especially look at the civil society sphere and the um, society and what is happening there. So when I was looking at your title um, and wondering, did non-democracy, did the system um, help China beat COVID? I um, started to think of the friends I see who live a normal life in Beijing nowadays, and everything seems to be back to pre-COVID times. And I asked myself always, where does the success come from? My first uh, thought, though, was not the system. It was the experience that China already has in dealing with pandemics. And this definitely had a high impact on um, how it could beat COVID so quickly after having already had SARS not so long ago. Um, then there's also a cultural difference. Maybe it could be because we see many Asian countries dealing well or better with Corona than us. But those are also democratic countries, for example, like Taiwan and um, South Korea. Um, we don't, we can't look at China and the success story they are showing us without thinking of the most sophisticated propaganda machinery in the world working there. We need to differentiate between what is lauded as the success of the CCP, of the Communist Party against um, COVID, and what is the ongoing find, fight of the Chinese people against this pandemic. Um, the former is an already known result. There is no other for the, uh, for the CCP to beat Corona, because it's about stability, it's about legitimacy, they they, there can't be another end. However, the latter is what we are really looking at. And I want to quote um, a very known author who during, um, during the lockdown in Hubei wrote, compared to the immovable state institutions, which are stubbornly clinging to prescribed procedures and unable to, seem unable to learn, um, it's actually the people of civil society which behave superiorly. Their approach is based on real conditions and it's urgently necessary that the authorities here in China learn from them. During the lockdown in Hubei, it was civil society and it was volunteers that made it possible for people to get to food, to get to work, to get to the hospitals if necessary. And to me, this shows that Corona and the success story in China is not due to the non-democratic system, but it showed the limitations and weaknesses of the system. And it was the people that um, made the success possible. Now China is back to a seemingly pre-corona state. Its economy is going to be one of the uh, probably most easily healed ones in the whole world. But while it might have strengthened the CCP's position in some eyes, it also showed weaknesses. It made people ask for more freedom of speech in China. We had hashtags and um, social media content to this regard. It also threw China into a huge international reputation crisis. And we really have to see what is going to happen in looking forward now. We are also not uh, supposed to forget that we are actually lacking data and insight into what is really going on on the ground in China, because we only get what is being filtered outwards. And this is probably not the whole truth on the state of uh, Corona in China. So yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion. There are many points I would like to go deeper into, but this is just a first taste of my opinion on this matter. Thank you very much. We will definitely go deeper into these points. So uh, thanks again. And uh, who wants to come next, uh, Richard or Shuming? Richard. Okay, I can I, I can take it from here. Thank you very much for organizing. Um, so I'll be I'll be brief. Um, basically, just uh, give my short remark based on the on the title. And uh, I think the answer really depends 
um, I think what uh, what Joanna was saying now, um, it I, I, I would say that there is really big difference between how Chinese citizens answer to this question right now, sitting in April 21, and how people in the West would answer it, and also how people in the rest, so to say. So as uh, as Agota mentioned, we did, we did some public opinion surveys in 13 European countries in September, October. And um, well, the, the results pretty much show that uh, most of Europe uh, perceive China very negatively. Um, and um, most, most of the people actually, and that is to, to a large extent because of the COVID. So the idea in, uh, among mo many people in the West is that uh, China didn't handle the COVID well, then it spread and so on and so on. Um, but then now the, the, the other things come into play and that is uh, the rest of the world, uh, we don't really have very good evidence that this very skeptical view of the West is shared. Um, already, if you look in Serbia, if, if you look in Russia, but even if you look in Latvia, which are some countries we've surveyed, uh, the view of China there is not negative. Uh, in Serbia, actually, if anything, the view of China has significantly improved because of the COVID. And the people that really perceive China as handling COVID very well, as helping them with the medical supplies, with the vaccination, and so on and so on. Now, the COVID is not over. And uh, it is really important how the whole crisis will end, because I hope it will end. Um, and, you know, um, if China will provide vaccines to most of the world, you know, it's quite obvious how the rest of the world will think, whether the West or the China uh, handled the crisis well. Now, let me finish with a few words about what the Chinese citizens think, because at the end of the day, for the Communist Party in China, this is really what matters primarily. And um, as Joanna said, and I agree with that, we don't have perfect evidence, of course, what the Chinese people think, but we do have some indications. And these indications really show that the support for Chinese Communist Party has never, never been larger right now. Uh, yes, it's true that in February 2020, there was massive outcry of criticism. There were calls for freedom of speech. Uh, many Chinese people expected that uh, China didn't handle the beginning of the virus well, and that was because of the authoritarian regime. But now let's face the reality. Since March and April, um, the European democracies, many other Western democracies, handled the situation so badly that in comparison, the Chinese performance looks amazing. And, uh, you know, from what I see, even many liberal mining, liberal leaning Chinese people, well, you know, when they are looking at the situation, and I think uh, Joanna mentioned as well, people in China are living their lives pretty normally. I mean, I'm here in Olomouc under lockdown for about half a year. Uh, we had another lockdown in spring. Most of you are in a similar situation. Um, you know, in this situation, it's very understandable how Chinese people would think, you know, who is performing well and who, uh, who is legitimate in their, uh, in their eyes. And, you know, there was, for instance, a survey in China um, by the YouGov. Um, they did survey in many other countries. And they asked um, if a vaccine was produced in different countries, uh, would you trust it more than, than otherwise? If Chinese people were told that the vaccine is produced in China, 83% said they trusted more. This is way more than in any other country. If American people were told this vaccine is produced in the US, only 36% were more willing to trust. In Germany, the number is about 44%. So in no other country, there is such strong confidence in what they are doing. And just to finish up, this is remarkable because many of us know uh, that Chinese people actually used to have a lot of trust in Western products. Milk, um, Western products had the, the image of being of good quality they could rely on. And uh, I'm not saying this is only the result of COVID. Uh, we've seen shift in these perceptions over recent years, but COVID has just escalated this. And uh, so 
unfortunately, from my perspective, uh, the answer for, for, I would say, most Chinese people is yes, Communist Party is uh, proving to be a legitimate ruler because of how it has handled the pandemic in, co in relation to, to other countries. Many thanks, Richard. And now I'm very curious about uh, Xu Ming's uh, opening statement. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for your opinion. Um, I prefer to compare the administration now the society, not the citizens, uh, because uh, it is about the legitimacy. It is about how the government is handling it. I, I'm agreeing uh, with uh, the thesis that the citizens are very important, uh, that the citizens handle this crisis very differently. But now I focus just upon the administration. So we should not forget how this crisis began. It began with uh, grave mistakes made by administration. We should not forget it. And I don't think that the Chinese people have already forgotten it. Nobody talks about that. Nobody is allowed to talk about that. And you can ask question after question, nobody would tell you something. This is so dangerous. So, so we cannot rely upon some social statistics on the one side, but let's uh, focus upon the administrations, not just the administration in China. Uh, I think that the administration in Taiwan, in South Korea, they handled the, the crisis not very differently in the substantial phases. They ordered the social distancing, they ordered the protection of the, their their citizens, like Chinese government, from 23rd of uh, January 2020 onward, tried to do. But there is a, a big difference. The big difference is three administrations were all capable to draw all resources needed very quickly and distributed them very quickly. So they all three are successful. And we can also compare the administration in Germany in the first phase to overcome the crisis. The Germany, German government was even a little bit more successful as the Chinese government due to some other factors. If we compare that Chinese uh, lockdown from 23rd of January to 23rd of May, as the Chinese government declared the victory over the pandemic. If we just take this, this period of time, it was about four months, a little bit more four months. German government declared the lockdown by the end of February. And by the middle of, of, of May, Germany opened gradually up the whole society. And we, we can also compare the, the scope of uh, lockdown uh, imposed in China. It was absolutely 100%. Every uh, uh, factory was closed. All the provinces were, were uh, involved. There is no exception. And it was so hard that the citizens were forbidden to set their feet outdoor. Sometimes the whole villages lacked uh, supply. So it was a very, very high toll that the Chinese administration has taken to fight the pandemic. I'm not uh, saying that the German government did everything good, but it is an experience that also Western democracy, not just the Asian one, if they did something good, like uh, drawing resources quickly and distribute it quickly, they also could succeed. So this is an, again an ex example that is not due to political system, but due to very detailed behavior, principles, procedures, every administration has to do. And the, the third aspect I would add is the vaccination as a phase. 
We see uh, the United States, we see the Britain. Both countries, uh, democracies made great, great, great mistakes at the beginning. And both countries was under very populistic administration. Donald Trump and uh, Johnson. Both leaders say there wasn't that great danger. Believe us, just go on, yeah? But then we see the changes. Joe Biden came to, to power. We now have, within the 100 days, 200 million shots given to the American people. The curves change. We, we are not very certain how fast it would change. But from the very, very bad situation onward to this situation right now, I must say it is a great performance. So it is a democracy, it is a Western democracy, but it is a de democracy which administration was competent and capable to draw all resources needed and to distrib distribute it to their people consequently. So again, this phase of vacation shows it is not due to the political system. It is due to the performance of the very administration. Some of the Western administrations like French, Italian, and, and Germany, in the second phase until now, have made many grave mistakes that they are discussing about it. But this is not that they think about their democracy. It is not that they say, our democracy are failing. And maybe the last one. So the acceptance of the Chinese administration during the phase of vaccination is now trembling. We, we, we know that uh, uh, leading viral, viral, uh, virologists like Zhong Nanshan said, Chinese vaccines are okay because these vaccines prevent people to die. And these vaccines prevent people to be hospitalized. As people ask him why Chinese vaccines don't work to prevent the outbreak, to prevent the very fast spreading, he gave no answer. And this was a very essential uh, issue. We know from many sources, independent from each other, that Chinese citizens increasingly refuses Chinese vaccines. They were mostly forced to take these vaccines during the, the months to end of 2020. It was not that the, the free will taking these vaccines. So with all this aspect, I just leave that to our uh, open debate. Uh, my conclusion is that we should not hurry with our assumption that democracy is failing and uh, authoritarian system like those in China is successful. Uh, thank you very much, Shining. Um, actually, um, all of you have uh, already answered what would have been my uh, initial question, whether you would relate the efficiency of the Chinese state to its political system. So uh, uh, I'd, I'd rather jump now to the second topic that has also been mentioned uh, by, uh, by all of you practically, um, and namely that uh, uh, this different approach that we see in uh, several countries in Asia, not just in China. Uh, the idea of uh, uh, tracking, testing, isolating. Uh, so this policy has, uh, has not just been practiced in China, but also in Taiwan, South Korea, as you're saying. So are we talking here about uh, um, a certain Asian governance model uh, or um, uh, what is it? So uh, why uh, why is the approach of the policy so different and uh, why is it more efficient than what we are doing here? Should I start? Yeah, Richard. 
Yeah, uh, it's great that I think all of us, we agree that uh, the explanation with the political regimes um, is certainly not, uh, not perfect. Um, and I think the explanation with culture is not perfect either because um, we have Australia, we have New Zealand who have handled the, the crisis pretty, pretty well. Um, and these are the Western um, democracies. Um, which are not, so to say, Confucian uh, culture or something like that. So, you know, what I want to say is that um, we should definitely not settle down for one factor which could explain it, you know, you know, either that it's authoritarian regimes which are capable or that it's some kind of Confucius culture which is capable. And, you know, actually, this kind of explanation, they are actually they are really counterproductive and I think part, they actually explain to some extent why Europe has handled it so badly. And I, I, I do say that Europe has handled it worse than uh, we said these Asia Pacific various countries. Um, and I think that it, it's partly because many people will say, you know, it worked with, in China because they are authoritarian country right? They are these kind of Confucian people. They obey authority, they obey rules. When, when the government tell them to be in lockdown for two months, they will do it, you know, but here in Europe we value freedom, so it would never work. You know, I, I really think that this explanation is just not true. Right now in Europe, we have been in way longer lockdown than even people in Wuhan. <laughs> so if anything, uh, yes, we don't follow it because after one year, everyone is totally fed up with the whole thing. But, you know, in, in fact, you can probably understand that uh, you, you, you know, the, the, the reason why China, after the first weeks of mishandling crisis, why it was able to turn things around 180 degrees, is that it really imposed these very drastic sanctions. But then there is the second thing, and that is it kept these measures in place till they basically run to zero cases. And then whenever there were new cases, they reimposed these very strict uh, measures. Now, what we did here in Europe, for instance, in Visegrad countries, um, over the first wave, we handled it pretty well because governments got scared, people got scared, and then we locked down our countries for two months. But then uh, we opened it up, Czech Republic declared COVID is over, people started celebrating, and then there were the new uh, focus points, but people were said, no, it's over. Well, you know, it, it will never come. Well, but then the end of summer came and it was just too late because the COVID was everywhere. And then you try to reimpose uh, measures for second time, for third time, for fourth time. Of course, people would not, would not follow that. So this is really not about culture, <laughs> certainly not. This is just about basic trust on the side of the citizens that uh, your government do something and you trust that, that what they suggest make, make some sense. So, so just maybe to pinpoint few factors which I think were important. One is the risk aversion. So in China, China is basically the Chinese authorities after a few weeks decided to impose very strict measures because they, want, they didn't want to take chances that the crisis could become bigger. Uh, compared to that, many Western European countries, and for instance, Fang Fang wrote it in her diary in April, she said that Western European countries were arrogant, overconfident. The Taiwanese Minister of Defense, if I'm not mistaken, said the same thing. The Western countries were overconfident and arrogant because we thought our health system, healthcare systems, can just handle it later on. We don't need to take measures now. When things get worse, then we take measures. Well, that was too late. So that's the first thing I want to say. And the second thing, and this is really ironic, um, democracies in Europe prove to be quite rigid, not flexible. And this is re remarkable because, you know, here in post-communist Europe, we think about the Soviet Union as the rigid system. We think about our Eastern communist regimes as the rigid systems. <laughs> in fact, right now, the, the discourse turned because we talk about author authoritarian China as the supposedly flexible system which can impose sanction. Let me finish with a personal uh, experience. Some of you I know from Chern, 
uh, which is the cost uh, action, kind of the Europe-wide network, a research network. Last year, in early March, CHERN had a conference in Portugal. Now, uh, I didn't, go, I bought the ticket for this conference, but when the crisis, when the COVID started spread, I decided not to go. But the whole conference actually was decided that it will take place. And it was said that the COVID-19 is not yet pandemic. So the force majeure doesn't apply. So we will just go on with business as usual. Mind you, this was the time when Italian, North Italy already was burying people and the hospitals were not keeping track. The virus was already in Spain and the churn, which is the EU network, was still meeting in Portugal like, like nothing is happening. Now, I'm not saying it as a blame for churn people. I'm saying it as, a, as an example how rigid our system became, that many of us knew things are bad and are getting to get worse, but still, since it was not WHO declared world pandemic, there was no way how we could cancel the conference and reimburse the cost. So this is just one example how, you know, democracies in Europe turn out not to be very flexible, and this was a major problem. Thank you, Richard. Joanna or Shiming? Yeah, Shiming. I, I think I, I would add some uh, uh, aspect to what you have said, the flexibility. I think uh, I regarded this issue less from the perspective of being flexible or not. I regard this, view this from the interaction between society and administration. At the beginning, the um, Chinese government didn't have so much trust from the Chinese citizens. We know that. The, the lockdown in, in Wuhan was claimed as a very cruel. And uh, also, I, I did a research uh, about the whole province Hubei. Uh, Hubei had uh, 16 uh, cities. Everyone is a million city. And uh, uh, except uh, Wuhan, every other city was uh, lacking everything resources, hospital, everything. And people were mourning, uh, not because of, of their deaths, but they're mourning that they are abandoned. The trust is not restored completely right now, as the propaganda would like to make people believe. But this is another question. The interaction between the Chinese government and the people was a very good example to say, what is not to do. Now to European, the interaction at the beginning uh, in many countries was just normal. So the, the government was scared, the citizens are scared. They agree very easily to interact in agreement. We all have to be careful. We all have to bring some sacrifices. So this, based at the successes at the beginning in many European countries. But after that, the pattern of interaction changed. The people say, well, we are successful. And the government say, well, we are successful. And they don't interact with each other to discuss what's the next risk. Since I have been living in Germany, I know Germans a little bit well. I, I think Germans are very fear, fearful people. Germans uh, appreciate very much risks. Whenever they face something, they say, what is the risk? But in this very specific situation, most Germany didn't ask what risks are there still. And I think if something is going wrong, not with the administration alone and not with the society alone. Something is going wrong with the interaction. How to ask, how to debate, and how to find the balance. And I think the, the unflexibility of German society is just now that this debate brings to no conclusion. They are still debating every time, yeah? And we see in another de democracy, for example, uh, Joe Biden. He didn't discuss so much anymore. He said, 
we just give shot, 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 shot. But the, the interaction in the United States will, uh, proves again, after one year disaster, the Americans were so fed up with this fast infections and, and increasing deaths, they, they went along. They are going along with, with the administration. The, and the, the interaction there is not very flexible, but it is very successful. It is related to a democracy. And you mentioned Australia and New Zealand. I also observed their very, very comparable curves of the interactions. So they were very strong protests, that, but the citizens are ready to interact with the government in, in French, in Italy, in some other West European countries. I don't know uh, the situation in Eastern European countries, but I'm not very sure that the, these interactions are so in the focus we should pay attention to. Another question is South Korea. We, we see one example, one exception in South Korea. Um, this, is, this was a Christian church who disobeyed the, the, the first orders, who said, we are the authority. We are on the side of God and God is going to protect us. And we see just the greatest outbreak in the country. They refused to interact with the society and with the administration. And that, I think, is one of the cruel conjunction to decide whether successful or failure. Thank you very much, Ming. And I'm very curious about Johanna's uh, opinion because you have actually uh, experience with Taiwan yourself. Um, I agree with many of the things that were sent, said by um, the other panelists before, some not so much. Um, I mean, if you ask directly about Taiwan, uh, we have to understand that um, what is for many seen as, um, as a very good way of dealing with a pandemic is the way of dealing after a pandemic trauma that Taiwan went through during um, SARS, um, there was a huge issue and people were extremely scared. There was a whole hospital that uh, became isolated during that time. And that is basically the reaction we've seen in Taiwan was the reaction of the traumatized people who have found a way to react better. And um, often when we see things um, happening in, for example, as so mainland China, we think, oh, this is flexibility. This is uh, quick reactions is not. It's plans that have been in the bottoms of some desks for years. And uh, they are being adapted and they're quickly being implemented. And um, so I wouldn't be too, um, too optimistic about flexibility and quick reaction times. Um, it's, it's the closeness to epidemics that happened before of many, uh, which made many of the countries react so successfully. Um, it's definitely also an issue for us about um, epidemic orientalism. We lost a lot of time in our reactions. We were what you call it's arrogance. It's again, it has a lot to do with distance and um, orientalism in this issue as well. That's not to be underestimated. And um, this is also, the question was also one about uh, what about this tracking, testing, and isolation? Is this Asian trades? Is this what is so different about this issue? And um, I have to admit, there is, uh, we are maybe not looking too much into it because, from our perspectives, it's such, a, it's such an unimportant thing. But I think digitalization and the way it is used to, as in administrative issues in many Asian countries is it. Is had a big impact on how they deal successfully with Corona. Um, for us, the tracking issue, I mean, I have had the Corona app on my cell phone since the very beginning. It used to show me some low risks, but other than that, nothing. And I don't have any risk um, me uh, measures now on it for months while the numbers are rising. What is wrong with us? Why is this tracking not working for us? 
but it's working so very well in, um, in many Asian countries. And um, I think also the isolating thing is, um, has been completely differently handled in many other countries. But really we had families were separated. When one family member got um, corona, others were isolated from them. I don't know anything like that happening here. One, uh, my aunt had corona and she was uh, quarantined with her whole family. Children that have uh, been living outside already came back to be isolated together with their parents. So um, there's, there is a lot which has been dealt with differently. And there's a lot um, of things that many countries are just ahead of us. Wearing masks, such a big issue in Germany. They love to talk about it endlessly. While in many countries where I've been in Asia, it's the most normal thing that when you're at risk, you put on a mask when you go out. It's so very, very normal. And um, I think, yeah, those are definitely issues that I would raise rather than, um, than cultural traits, for example. And also the consistency of the quarantine system, the transparency of the communication. I am so sad to say that we cannot keep up in these issues um, with many of the countries where we see more success. The, um, the interdepartmental powers that have been mentioned by the other speakers, where health ministry can decide this is the way we go and no other departments can overrule that. It's, it's just not happening in our system. So yeah, I mean, um, in this regard, administrative issues and the interplay of population and administration is definitely something we should look more into and not so much i think about flexibility um it's um really it's institutional knowledge and um, knowledge transference that's just that we are not taking on that's a shame to be honest maybe just one thing uh, to to um add to I think we are talking about cultural, but maybe it is too big for us to talk about. Maybe we should talk about one aspect. For example, the individualism. In Europe and in some other uh, democracies, the individualism is now being exaggerated. Every individual approach turns quickly into some legal claim. So it is so strong that none of the politicians dare question that. None of the political party dare question the will of the citizens, the will of those who don't agree with us. So, so we have to debate with that. And if you don't agree with the debate, you, you you are Asian, you, you, you are obeying some orders, but we are far from obeying anything. We are very close at the view how individuals understand themselves. So you, you mentioned the, the, the families. The family is in so many countries, the basic unit. I think the Italian is well known for their sense for family, but why didn't it work? So with this very strong family tradition. And I think if you turn every individual or every wish of an individual family into some sort of holiness, into some sort of legal rights, legal claims, and you say, that's my right, I defend my right, I don't care. And if that is then exaggerated by some other sort of um, authorities, I just mentioned this church in South Korea. I just mentioned the, uh, the, the, the churches, many churches in America supporting uh, Donald Trump and say, we are the Christians, we are best protected. They exaggerated these claims of every individual's disregarding that the relationship between individuals and their um, environment is interactive. It's, there is no absolutely right claim on either side. Not the com community could de decide. You have to do that. If you don't do that, I will punish you to death. And either 
on the other side, no individual should have the right to say, this is my thing, I don't care. But we see in so many European countries that they say, we are fed up, we just go out, I don't care. So I think we should take a little bit of respect um, of the community, but not the community in the sense to say, you have to obey, but the community that we have to take of each other. That we say, okay, if I go out, I might be the next sick. If you go out, you might be the next, but if I go out, you might be the next infected. And I think in the years of the globalization, in the years of this commercialization of daily life, this individual claim, this awareness that we always have the right to claim at the individual, this is one of the factors I would pay more attention to. I would suggest that we should check in, into it. So the protest uh, movement in, in many societies, in Berlin, we see this demonstrations. They, they defy the, the government just with this side. We are the citizens and we do it. There are other the democracies, they, they emphasize the same freedom of expression, this freedom of, of gathering, etc. but they don't exaggerate these individual claims. Uh, yeah, Richard, just very briefly because we need to move on. Yeah. Sure, okay. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on what uh, Joanna was saying about the trauma from SARS and also about the, the issue of flexibility, which I brought. Um, first of all, I, I do think that in Taiwan, in South Korea, and generally in East Asia, the experience of SARS did help them um, to prepare better for uh, COVID. But you know, I'm not so sure whether such experience would uh, produce same results, for instance, here in Europe. Because, I mean, come on, um, as, we, as we all said, the first wave in Europe, actually we handled it somehow. And then in summer, Europe was in a relatively good shape. So if the argument about taking lesson and trauma from a previous pandemic would work, then actually we should have been even more scared and start responding uh, in summer when cases were slowly growing. Instead, well, for instance, in the Czech Republic, as I'm based here, um, when, at the beginning of summer, the cases appeared on Polish-Czech border. It was dismissed. It was said, well, it's just one region. We don't need to worry. Then it was five regions. They said, well, you know, the tracking is working well. Then the percentage of positive uh, testing was growing and people started saying, that's because we know who to test. Uh, and you know, these sort of explanations, it was exactly opposite uh, what, what I agree with Joanna was the case in Taiwan, in South Korea. So I wouldn't exaggerate the importance of this previous trauma because at least in Europe, the trauma of the first wave didn't work, quite the opposite. And uh, one more thing about the tracking, because really the way how Europe totally mishandled tracking is example how we were not flexible. So again, in Slovakia or the Czech Republic, tracking com completely collapsed at the end of summer. And why? Because uh, the, the people who were supposed to track, these people were at the personal level, which was totally not prepared for a pandemic, which is understandable. But now my question is why they didn't hire hundreds of new people, thousands of new people. And you know, the, and this is not me asking, this was question asked the, the administrations and the answer was, they are not trained, you know, but what, what we needed was a massive call center, right? If you don't, you don't have to be specifically trained. You don't have to be epidemiologist or doctor, whatever. You need to know how to call and many people lost their jobs. So this is, in my opinion, for instance, one example, how we were not flexible. And you could find many other examples in, you know, how some measures were not taken at the time when they were supposed to be taken. 
Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, at this point, I definitely want to move on uh, to the question that is, so uh, let's Shandor Kushai join in uh, as uh, uh, a commenter. Um, and uh, this brings us closer to, um, uh, to uh, the hot topic of, of today, um, uh, of uh, this increasing polarization uh, in, in the international arena. Uh, you have also mentioned, uh, Joanna, you just mentioned Orientalism, and uh, we have been talking about Western arrogance, flexibility, non flexibility. Uh, what we see today is uh, that China is increasingly perceived in the media as the other. Uh, so we are actively othering China. Um, and uh, the narrative of, uh, uh, of China as a threat, as a potential threat to us is growing actually day by day. So uh, at this point, I uh, want to, um, uh, to hear a little bit uh, about the question, how do you see this polarization? Because uh, it seems that the EU is moving between two extremes. So uh, one extreme is the United States and the other extreme is China. Uh, and at this point, I definitely want to hear Shandor Kushai's opinion on this as, an, as a diplomat working in China. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. So, yes, okay. So, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank our panelists because uh, it was very revealing and uh, very interesting to have, uh, to hear their different views, uh, which were, by the way, very much similar in many aspects. Uh, I think, uh, let me return to the basic question because uh, of our meeting today because I think the question uh, misle is misleading in itself. I think uh, the management or, or handling the COVID-19 crisis and democracy has nothing to do with each other. Like traffic rules and gravitation has nothing to do with each other. Uh, so, uh, the issue in itself, I think, uh, and it, it is the major issue which we in Europe shall pay attention to, is that uh, a pandemic and epidemic situation in every society is one of the greatest challenges. And every society will react uh, to any pandemic or any epidemic, in, in, if it is in one country, according to its um, situation, its uh, actual status. And that's why I agree very much with uh, what uh, Shiming told us. The handling of the coronavirus crisis pandemic is much more connected to the actual efficacy, effectiveness of administration and cooperation between society and administration. And there are the big differences. They are partially cultural, of course, they are partially based on political system or whatever. All those are factors of influencing it. But the major issue which which I think is very important to understand that uh, the situation, the contradictions, the problems of our societies and the problems of our, the effectivity of our administration coinciding influence our handling of the crisis. And just to turn to the question which you posed to me, the present situation of a, of, the, of a beginning of a new Cold War, what we see now, making this problem, this situation even more problematic. And I think that is very important for us in Europe to know. We have two major uh, poles in this, this evolving situation, which Personally, in my analysis, I call New Cold War. 
and uh, this um, tension between the two sides makes us Europeans uh, to make choices which are not good for us. We shall not make choices in Europe. It's, it's a bad um, situation. It, it's by definition bad. Whether we like, just I mentioned what, what uh, Richard and uh, Mr. Schimming just mentioned, trust in vaccines, whether they are Western vaccines or Eastern vaccines. This is a misleading issue. It's not a political issue. And we are made to make political decisions. Or in some countries, uh, for some people in Western Europe, this question is not even posed because the European Union uh, uh, Drug Administration does not approve Eastern vaccine and full stop. So the question does not exist. In the United States, there are only US vaccines approved. If you go a little bit east, in Russia, there are only Russian vaccines. In China, there are only Chinese vaccines approved. And in some countries which are more lucky, like in Hungary, we have five different vaccines from three different parts of the world approved. And I can inf uh, inform you that I am very happy because I am almost free to go around because I, am, I got all the two shots of vaccines three weeks ago. So in theory, I am protected as much as anybody can be protected. But the bad news is that I got the Chinese vaccine, the Sinopharm vaccine. So I am happy on one hand from Western point of view because I already protected. And on the other hand, I must be very sorry or, or, or yeah, very uh, unhappy in, in Western terms because I got the Chinese vaccine. So the issue I just wanted to tell you this example because that shows how misleading our whole approach is. And in Europe, I think we can, we should uh, have a higher point of view. We shall get out of this box, this box of, of Cold War, this box of, of uh, political controversy. The COVID-19 is not an issue of democracy or autocracy or what kind of rule. It's a question of elementary functioning of society, administration, and governing, governance to be exact. And I think that's where we can learn from China. And of course, China can learn from us. Uh, at the beginning, an open society would react and an open government would react much faster and, and could handle the situation much better. But in the later stage, when, when the pandemic was already here, our democracies spent too much energy on debating issues and too little energy to taking action. And one more comment, I, I loved very much what uh, our colleague Shemings talked about, absolutization of individual rights. I would be very happy to say that for me and in my understanding, we shall need again some kind of intercultural balance. Of course, individual rights are really extremely important but there must be limitations for everything, including individual rights. And I can imagine one for, in that respect, one very important limitation. That is, I have my rights, all of them, and I can exercise them up the point until the exercising of my right hurts other people's rights. 
So when I declare that I am free to go out, uh, not wearing masks, not keeping social distancing and so on, in that case, my action, the exercise of my individual free, rights to freedom may endanger other people, hurt other people's basic rights. For example, their human right to life. And there, when the government shall come in, the legal system shall come in, the administration shall come in, and impose some restrictions on my individual rights. And our society has some problems with that. We can see the other end of the story, the, the four months long uh, lockdown in, in Wuhan, where this other aspect was overtaken everything. The limitation of individual rights was absolute. So I think that those are the problems and we Europeans shall have an open mind to study what happens all over the world, not only in Europe, in China, in other parts of the world. Thank you. Sorry, I'm muted. So uh, thank you very much, Shandor. I, I definitely want to uh, give the chance to our panelists to, to react to that first, and then I want to open the floor for the questions. I have already five questions. So uh, yeah, we are running on a tight schedule. Yeah, but first reactions to that, I'd really appreciate that. Right, so I? You, yeah, Joanna, yeah. All right. I think what uh, was just being said right now, uh, there was a lot of truth in it. And I'm definitely actually a supporter of we in Europe and uh, in the country I live in, having that line inside where freedom starts to hurt others, we draw a line. And I think most um, of the EU members have those lines in their um, in their laws. So I am not afraid about that, about too much individualism. Um, hurting others. Um, there is a system for that here. Um, I'm also very much uh, against choosing sides. We don't have to choose a side as European. We will be European. We will not say we are American, we are not say, Chinese, we are European and we, will, we are working on putting our foot down on where we want to stand. It's a long process, it's not an easy one, but we are doing it and I'm very proud of being part of an era where it's been being done. And um, yeah, about this, um, about the pandemic being politicized. It is, it has been happening from the very start on. It is a question of legit legitimacy and stability for China. It has become a question of um, painting an enemy for the US. Everybody politicized the pandemic and their reaction to it. And it was a global race in doing that as well. Um, um, there was this uh, one this um, sentence, a government's legitimization lies in what it achieves for its people, no matter the system we are talking about. And the CCP um, was looking to beat COVID and to come out of the crisis as strong as possible domestically and internationally, which led to certain policies, which led to certain uh, to a certain nationalistic flavor of their success, which of course in many Western liberal countries had a horrible impact on people's view of China's success in this matter. And um, not only of China's success in, this, uh, in dealing and misdealing the crisis, um, but also it fueled anti-Chinese and even anti-Asian racism worldwide. It has become a really awful issue up to violence against people due to them being people of color. And um, where China has done well in fighting the health crisis, um, the global diplomacy crisis this pandemic has led to is still underway. And we are part of fighting against this because we cannot leave it, let it stand. Um, next Saturday, there will be on, in Cologne, um, there will be a demonstration. We will all keep space to each other we will do it safely but we will demonstrate against anti-asian racism that is of high importance and um we have to one more point i wanted to make because we've talked about this perception in and 
perception difference between um, how we see the successes and failures of pandemic. And um, the, we also have different perceptions of how the relations have turned. I mean, most of the people in China do not know much about the um, political diplomatic crisis between China and Europe, for example, because all they get in hometown news, I read those Chinese news, is, oh, how great it was when Wang Yi was visiting Germany. Nothing bad was mentioned. Everything was fine. I mean, the sanctions came. That's the first time I saw something bad written about European-Chinese uh, relationships in Chinese news. And it was not pretty. It turned immediately to Nazi Germany coming back, and it was disgusting. I've never seen anything as awful like that. For many Chinese, they fell out of heaven. They didn't know where it came from, because before that, everything was fine in Chinese media. So um, yeah, perceptions are also this information discrepancy is uh, another issue that we, as somebody who cooperates with Chinese um, organizations and individuals regularly, we have to deal with. Because um, while we in the West all have this enemy picture um, and these uh, China bashing issues, in the East, we often have a very one-sided media reporting on those issues as well. So, yeah, I, I didn't touch about on on any on all the issues that we wanted to talk about. I think uh, just just a few of them. Yeah, thank you, thank you for mentioning that. It's actually very very broad, and uh, we can well, we could we could talk uh, a lot longer about those issues. Um, I do not want to mute you, Richard and Shumeng, but we definitely need to move forward to the questions. And uh, thanks. And uh, uh, I think you can also embed your reactions into uh, your answers because uh, because all the answers have something to do, of course, uh, uh, with um, uh, what we have been talking about this for. So uh, the first question is uh, actually connects right away to what Yuna has been uh, talking about. Uh, do you think China will aim to improve his, this negative perception of its pandemic management by the Western world, or were there image building focus more on third countries. So this is about perceptions. So I think um, there are two aspects to pay attention to. The one is um, the propaganda. Um, uh, like uh, when I uh, said, uh, the propaganda has a very strong uh, effect upon the Chinese perception of the world. Um, on one day, Germany is great. And on the other day, Germany is the devil. Uh, German uh, negotiated with Japanese and uh, many Chinese ask uh, this fascist uh, past uh, is not catching up with, with both. So uh, I think we have to deal with this uh, so-called uh, image uh, campaigns. Uh, the other side is the perception of China. Uh, I think we'd better do everything possible uh, to separate uh, this perception of Chinese on the one side and the Chinese administration on the other one. It is not said that we have to condemn the Chinese administration in a case, but we need to separate them. It is not the duty of every Chinese to say, we have to handle uh, everyone correctly. We don't even have enough information about them. Uh, and it is not the duty of the Chinese citizen to say, uh, we are better protected. They don't know whether they are uh, better protected or not. Uh, so, so many Chinese are rushing to buy uh, BioNTech Pfizer uh, as this came to China. So they, they so so much they don't trust the Chinese vaccines as they want. They they made statements about that. Uh, as far as there were only Chinese vaccines, they had to trust or. Many of them were forced to take that. So I think uh, one of the major points is also to avoid the second Cold War, is this single out of Chinese people on the one side and the rest from China on the other one. If we succeeded, we, we can do a lot of uh, things to prevent this Cold War reaching European if we don't succeed it. I'm afraid that the European won't have so many choice. So the Russian on the one side, the, the Chinese on the other side, you need the protection. So you, you have to take the American approach or Chinese is a great, great economy. You need the business, you need the Chinese. 
I think it is not just a moral standing. It is a, a practical matter to separate people from administration, to say this is not the issue that Chinese are bad. This is not that the Communist Party is doing everything wrong. It is that we have to look into it. This is that we have to differentiate it more precisely and very cautiously. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Yes. If I can just very briefly jump in, uh, because this is a topic with, which uh, both uh, other speakers mentioned. Uh, I actually have an article coming out in Asian survey. And uh, unfortunately, our survey, which we did in 13 European countries, it proves that Europeans do link Chinese people and China. So uh, as Joanna mentioned, as uh, Shiming mentioned, of course, this is very unfortunate, but it, ha it happens. It is here that people who have more critical view of China because of human rights, because of other things, they also have more negative view of Chinese people. So this is, this is just a very unfortunate fact. And um, to come back on your question, Agota, I think uh, right now Chinese government uh, cannot really do much to improve its image in the West. Um, I think it will continue focusing on its image at home. And this is interesting because the Chinese government, as also Joanna mentioned, due to propaganda, censorship, and so on, they want Chinese people to think that China is liked and respected around the world. It doesn't really matter whether that's the reality or not, but what matters for them is what the Chinese people think. And as a result, and that's interesting, um, I think that was uh, a, a, a Singaporean professor did the research in China right now, finding out that actually Germany, France, and other European countries are still quite positively viewed in China, uh, which is great, but I'm a bit worried that with the growing EU-China tensions and so on, this can take very quick down to, uh, downturn, as also Joanna mentioned, if Chinese media start uh, talking about these tensions. And then we really end up with Europeans having super negative views of China, which also transferred to Chinese people and culture and so on, and vice versa, Chinese people having these kind of views of Europe. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, pessimistic about this. It could happen and it would be very unfortunate. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, yeah, this is uh, really very important to, to understand. So I do appreciate that aspect. Thank you. Um, let us move uh, further in the questions. Uh, the next one is, why is it so difficult for us to recognize that in a crisis, democracies react slowly and are not able to implement strict freedom-limiting measures? We can still agree that on the long term, we prefer them. First of all... Freedom uh, limiting measures. Yeah, Shemming. First of all, I, I don't agree with this view. I, I think, uh, uh, as uh, Richard already mentioned, at the beginning of the pandemic, democracies didn't act uh, so slowly. It isn't really a question of speed. It is a question how to understand these interactions between administration of a democracy and uh, society. So uh, a, a democratic society cannot afford ignoring these interactions. At the beginning of the crisis, the government say, we are all scared, so let's move together. And the people are agreeing with that. It is also an interaction, but this interaction came uh, about very quickly, very fast. Uh, many societies made it also in Europe. But with the time passing, it's getting more difficult, difficult and difficult. So for the short response, I don't see any grave problem uh, with the speed of the responses, but in medium term and in long run, it is indeed a question. And for authoritarian system, for China, this curve is just uh, being put upside down. So we see, for example, the quick uh, 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 restriction 
imposed uh, uh, on every citizen, uh, this, this broad, uh, quickly, the success. But we now see this curve just turning. The vaccination, for example, is lagging. Why, why it is so? Because the, the, all the in, in, uh, um, um, a lagging transparency now beginning to work that people don't trust the, the vaccine. We don't know about the research. We don't know about the, the distribution. Just one example. Any other vaccines showing bad records would stop. And the authority was obliged to say, we stop this vaccine in this country for how long? But you never get any uh, news about Chinese authorities stopping Chinese vaccines. You, you simply don't know that they, they stop it. And people are not stupid. So they think, why uh, are our vaccines just uh, successful up to 50%, 50%, yes. The, the, the Pfizer is 96, the, the Moderna 94, uh, uh, 95, and even AstraZeneca 80. But Chinese vaccines is 50, but we never heard that this vaccine is stopped. And I think in long run, we see also a curve turning down for the authoritarian system. So we, what we no, need is not the arrogance to say we do everything better. No, we have to look at our problems. The problems in China should be take, taken care of by Chinese people themselves. We should support them to get more citizen rights, which should support them to openly speak about their real thoughts. My generation is growing up with one, just one wisdom. The wisdom reads, you don't say what you do and you do nothing what you say. This is the wisdom of my generation of Chinese. So you never know what we think. We don't tell you. Why should we tell you? So we are endangered, you are not. And you don't support us. And why should, should I tell you? No, nothing. Thank you very much, Shuming. Um, anything to add to that, or uh, shall we just move further? Okay, next question. Do you think that the initial underestimation of the severity of the crisis was impacted by the precedent of the 2009 H1N1 uh, pandemic and the subsequent, subsequent criticisms against the WHO? There are two reports from uh, Chinese institutes. The one was the Institute of the Military Science, uh, led by a woman named Chen Chen Bi. She reported that the uh, Chinese government uh, missed to uh, to assess properly the danger of the uh, of the pandemic or, or of the epidemic at the beginning. It was a very surprisingly uh, frank statement made by a Chinese general. And I think uh, this might have for so many other reasons we don't have time to talk about. But the thing is, the fact is, even Chinese general confess that they underestimate the danger. With all the tremors uh, of, of uh, all the disasters uh, happening in, in that country, I think the sec second question is the underestimation. In what sense? Many uh, institutions in European uh, country, even in, in Germany, that's the uh, Robert Koch Institute, reported to me as we discussed uh, together. They say. We didn't get uh, so much information from the Chinese researchers. We usually work together. So how can we estimate the danger? We cannot. They don't tell us how many people were, how quickly infected, how severely infected. We, we, we don't know. How can we tell our government to do or not to do something? We cannot. We can just assume the worst case. 
And the worst case is so big that we have to take a consideration to do the first things first and the second thing second. But it is just a guess. And I think this shows again the cooperation between government, not the ideologies, not the political systems, but the administrations. We talk about the global governments, but do we really mean that? Global government? Just exchanging the dangerous data with each other on time. In this issue, WHO didn't play a brilliant role at the beginning. That's what we have to confess. It is so. And I think that these two reports from Koch Institute and this journal in, in China, they tell us a, a great deal about the whole story. Yeah, Joanna. Everybody seems to be interested to add on to that topic on that question. Um, I just want to point out that here we see one of the real limitations um, that is systemic and also has a, to do with ideology in this regard, because there is a certain inability um, to admit to mistakes in authoritarian systems. Um, there might be some internal censorship, some movement there, but it can't get out of the country. That's why we see like Fang Fang was fine as, as long as she was representing the people inside of China, uh, helping to show the situation in Wuhan. But as soon as her voice got out, got international and showed um, that there was something wrong on the ground in China, then it became traitorship. Then it became um, you being against your own country, being against your people. And that is really one of the hard limits. The, we had Merkel just a few days ago admitting to having made mistakes in a very public display. That's not going to happen in China. And there we got into real trouble when we are dependent on international and globalized structures where we all have a part in and should all have a part in, like the WHO, where certain voices are already being censored, silenced, and blocked out, see Taiwan. Um, this is a systemic limitation, and there we uh, really get to the non-democratic issue. Uh, thank you. Shando, you also wanted to add something. Very shortly, because our, our time is leaving. Uh, just one or two elements. First, to the uh, gentleman or uh, lady who posed the question. Uh, we have a very big problem because we still don't know very much about what is happening in China. And sometimes even we don't know very much about what is happening in our countries uh, or in the US. Uh, that is one element which makes us very, uh, let's say, very puts on us limitations on what we can understand and act or act upon. One more issue is that we all live in information bubbles. The Chinese society has its own information bubble. We in the West live in a totally different information bubble. And sometimes we simply don't understand each other because we don't have the same information. And the last element is uh, our, the quality and situation of the organizations of our global governance, like WHO, totally correspond with the situation of our global society. And I agree that the WHO made mistakes early in the uh, pandemic, but it continues to make mistakes up till today because the WHO is not an independent actor. It depends on its member states. And for example, if we just leave a little bit our European bubble of information, our European world, please look what uh, the public opinion says in Africa, in Latin America, in South Asia, and so on. And the vaccine nationalism of the Western countries 
has a very, very bad opinion and the WHO could change it, could help it, but the WHO has very limited exercise, a very limited power because it's part of the global governance, which does not have independent power. The international organizations do have only so much power as the member states give them. And that's the major problem. Thank you. Yes, Richard. Very quickly, I just wanted to say something about the data problem, the, um, how we learn what's going on in China. And I must say, this is one of the most frustrating thing for me as a person who follows China. Of course, it's very difficult even for us to, to learn exactly what's going on in China. But you know, um, from mid January 2020 on, in my China watchers bubble, everyone recognized this is a huge problem. Wuhan was locked down, Hubei was locked down, uh, you know, and then, but when I started talking, for instance, to epidemiologists and people like this, and this, is, this comes to what Shuming mentioned, people who didn't necessarily, and who don't necessarily watch China and who get, you know, who work with statistic information, these people didn't recognize the problem. Because they said, you know, our statistic don't, don't tell us this is such a big problem. And then I felt that us, so to say, the China watchers who work with qualitative data, who maybe could recognize that Wuhan is in deep trouble, but somehow when we were, you know, saying this is a huge problem, we were not maybe listened to because, you know, who listens to sinologists, right? We listen to epidemiologists. But now the funny part comes into play. Now we are at the beginning of 2021 and most of us who watch China, we say that China's pretty much back to normal, that COVID is pretty much under control in China. But most people now don't trust the Chinese data and they say, well, you know, how can we know that, that that's true and so on. So in reality, uh, you know, initially many people watched blindly the official statistics and then they were surprised that they are not accurate which we knew, and now uh, these people say we cannot trust anything what's coming, what's coming out of China. So this is super frustrating for me. I just wanted to share that. And I think that explains also, you know, ex exactly the question, why we underestimated the problem. And also now it's fueling, uh, well, it also plays into whole Orientalism discourse and the ordering discourse and basically something that, you know, China's just out there a lot of weird things happening. We cannot know what's going on there. Thank you very much, Richard. Yes, uh, we need more more China knowledge or China competence, definitely. Yeah, I'm so sorry, but we need to close uh, the discussion at this point, even though, uh, uh, yeah, we have just uh, arrived at the point uh, where the really interesting questions are coming up. Uh, so uh, um, as a final gesture, I want to ask you to, uh, to articulate, come up with a question that you would see as the next most urgent question after the question of this discussion what would you ask if we had such a panel like um, in a month's time what would you ask one question i'm very very excited about that Just go if you have the question. May I? Yes. Just a very simple question. How could Europe make the necessary choice, choices in the changing international situation with regard to China? I think that would okay. be the major question. The COVID and other issues are only part of this major question. Thank you. Thank you. Joanna? <laughs> Thanks. I think it would be how do we back, get back to open dialogue, to not 
speaking alongside each other, like two one-way streets passing each other, but really get back to dialogue and cooperation again um, after what's been happening in the last year. Yeah, mine was a little similar. Uh, my, my would be how to deal with China as, a, as a, not as an other, but as a normal country, so, so to say, while at the same time recognize that we have different views and different values, different systems. So not to, not to slip into moral relativism, but at the same time deal with China as just a normal country, not as something exotic, other, uh, which, you know, is, as I said, far away. I would ask a question uh, which was asked me from by, by another person. Usually, uh, I was asked how to deal with China because I'm a Chinese. Um, as I at one webinar answered, I suggested we should start a dialogue as rivals. So the question came back instantly: What do you mean with rivals? Then I say, well, European uh, Union has stated China as a systematic rebel. This is official statement. The Chinese government, the political leadership in Beijing has stated that the European, like the Americans, are rebels. This is applicable since 2013. It's official. So if both sides identify the other side as rivals. How can we lie to, to ourselves to say, no, we're not rivals, we are rivals. But rivals are not enemies. It is not about to, to defeat or to be defeated, but to be honest, to say, we have other views. And to exchange these other views on the basis of mutual uses or mutual efforts to avoid even greater disasters. And then the question came to me, I just pass on to all of you. How can we do that? I don't know. Thank you very much, Shuling. Let's hope we have an opportunity sometime to yeah, walk further along this path. Yep. So many, many thanks to uh, all four of you. And uh, yeah, also many thanks uh, to the audience for being with us today. And I do hope uh, all of you enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>